And here we are. <clears throat> Sorry. And here we are. I'm Chris Brown, host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I am pleased to announce after amazing amount of interviews this year, over 200 interviews, whether it be online exclusives, whether it be in person, whether it be virtually via Zoom, 200 great interviews we conducted over this year. And this was our most popular time and time, month after month. This episode was always at the top of the list of the top 10 episodes each month. And this comes back to us in March of this year when we sat down with this person to talk about their first 100 days, their first 100 days in office. And I sat down with Calgary counselor for Ward 11, Courtney Penner. Uh, Counselor Penner and I talked about her first 100 days in office, how she saw everything was going, and moving forward, what she saw was some of the obstacles that she wanted to achieve over the year. So without further ado, here is our top episode of 2022 with Calgary Counselor Courtney Penner. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. This is our first live edition of the show in 2022. This is the first live edition of the show where we are planning on raising some money for some great organizations here in the city of Calgary. And this is the first live edition of the show post-surgery for Chris Brown, the host of the Cross Border Interviews, after my surgery back in December. So I do just bear with us as we try to work through our problems. But we're going to have a fun night tonight. And we're going to have a fun night tonight because of our guest, who is the current counselor for Ward 11. I've written it down. I usually don't take notes, but here they are. Uh, current counselor for Ward 11, Courtney Brannigan. Or Courtney Penner, sorry. Oh, God, this is already going to start. Counselor Penner, thank you so much for doing this. Chris, it is so good to be here. And, and you know, current counselor Courtney, that's a tongue twister. And, and I see the sign behind you. And I did I did campaign under Courtney Brannigan, but then um, I did go back to my maiden name. Yeah. So. Well, I appreciate you doing this. And I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy Thursday night and sitting down with us, helping raise funds for a great community organization here in the city of Calgary. And that is the Women's Center of Calgary. Now, before we get into the interview, uh, I just want to give everyone sort of a heads up of what, what we're doing here. Over the last year, in 2021, the outpouring of support that I received as the host of this show was overwhelming. We had people giving to the uh, show. We had people reaching out during uh, when my it was announced that my surgery has been postponed. And I wanted to give back. 2022, I want to give back to this great community of ours. And doing so, I want to help raise some funds because there are so many great organizations in this community. And there are so many people who are struggling. So I want to help give back in the way that I can do that. And Councillor Penner, when I reached out to her, I said, which organization would you like to help raise funds for? And she said the Women's Center of Calgary. So I got to ask the question, we'll start it off here. Why the Women's Center of Calgary? Well, why is it so important to you and so special to you? Well, I'm a woman person who identifies as a woman. Um, and the Women's Center uh, serves women. So there's that. That's the first connection. But I think the Women's Center for me has been a resource for myself. It's been a place where I've been able to go and connect with other women and learn and seek knowledge and build my leadership capacity skills. Uh, they run a program that I was fortunate to take part in. Uh, it's called Women Lead. And I have since then stayed involved with that program as a, as a co-facilitator. I've also volunteered with the Toy Drive, um, you know, both through in-person volunteer hours and through donations. And so for me, the Women's Center is doing amazing work connecting with women across socioeconomic status, um, across cultures. Uh, my daughter has taken some of their girls' programs there. So they're really this community-rooted um, generous 
giving organization who are who are empowering women to take the steps needed for that self advocacy um, and get the supports and services they need. Now, I appreciate you doing this because, as I said, you are the first one of these. So I appreciate someone being the guinea pig in this situation. And I appreciate your kind words that you sent me when I was going into the surgery. So after I was a little feeling a little bit better in January, I reached out and we were able to do this on a quick notice. So thank you so much. Um, before we jump into the interview, I want to say to the viewers right now who are watching, if you have questions during the interview, Please don't hesitate to comment and on the YouTube, scroll down below, comment, and we will try to pose as many questions to Councillor Penner as possible throughout the uh, evening. Now, I will let everyone know the amount that we raised at the end of the show, so if you want to stick to and see how much we raised, then just stick with us until the end of the show. But we will get into this interview now, and this is the fun part for me because I get to lead off the questionings. And... I asked the question, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? In our very first interview, season three, episode 27 of the Crossboard Interview Podcast, I asked you where your sense of duty to serve comes from. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the same question, but it's going to be a little bit different this time. How is your sense of duty to serve 100 days in as a city councillor? Uh, are you asking me? Is it still there? Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I... Um... It has, you know, through through the election, you know, through the campaign and through this first hundred days, um, it has looked different. Um, the election was very much focused on those sort of individual contacts and the one on one. And, and the first hundred days have very much been focused on learning um, about my colleagues, learning about an organization, learning about all the various departments and then meeting with a lot of the civic organizations in our city. And so um, and of course, from end of election season till now, of course, we've entered a fifth wave of COVID, which has very much changed the dynamic and how we've been able to interact again. My sense of duty is still absolutely there. I think I have learned through these 100 days the things that I am truly passionate about, um, the places I want to make a difference, um, and the projects that I want to undertake and work on. Now, there is a lot to digest over the last 100 days, and it's only been 100 days, literally as of today, 100 days from when you were sworn in as the counselor for Ward 11. I want to start back on that first day. Let's go right back to that first day on election day. You, you, you are officially declared, you are, I think if I'm not mistaken, the last person to be declared the winner of their ward. How yeah. was it sitting there watching the results come in, being nerve wracking because your name was back and forth between your closest challenger? Um, well, I wasn't sitting, <laughs> standing. <laughs> My family was sitting and I was like, shh, quiet. And, and it was, I mean, probably I would say about when about two thirds of the polls were in and once we had known kind of like the key areas that we had targeted we were pretty confident but I was like so hesitant and I never I didn't want to say it until like definitively that very last poll came in and, and they were just having some challenges with the tabulator and so um and just and uploading it to the online reporting so I had actually seen the numbers um and new but i did until it until the city website changed over i didn't want to say anything. um I, it was a really great night um like you know my family was with me my parents were here it was small it was maybe right not what a lot of people have on those election nights which is the big room but it was that i shared that experience with all other candidates right we were all in that same place when did when did it hit when did the weight of the position hit you? Because I've talked to many candidates, many politicians throughout my time in doing this show, and some say it hits the moment after, the day after you wake up and you realize this new weight of responsibility is on your shoulders. When did it hit for yourself? Sometime in December, I think, and I was driving in to the office and I was like, I am a counselor in Canada's fourth largest city. I'm, I'm a counselor in Canada's fourth largest. I was just like, that is, that's insane. That's insane. That's when it hit me. So yeah, it was sometime in December and we were, yeah, it was, it must've been around the time of the Petroleum Congress because, because, um, 
because Mayor Gondek was down there and we were doing sort of that like like for like comparison. So it would have been, I don't remember when that was, but that's when it would have been. And I, I really did. I was like, well, that is actually maybe kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, I, I want to stick on that first week of transition between getting elected mm-hmm. and being sworn in. Now, anyone who's listened to the show, who listened to episode 27, season three of the show, knows that you promised to bring cupcakes to that very first meeting. That very first mm-hmm. meeting of council. I, I didn't see photos of cupcakes, but was there cupcakes? Because these are the questions the constituents need to know if you are telling the truth or not as a candidate. Yeah, so I brought cupcakes during that transition week. But um, because of COVID, we were very spaced out in our like times that we were moving through things. So I kind of just had them out and like told people about it. Um, And only a few people stopped by. So in the end, I am giving most of the cupcakes to the security team uh, because they're always around. And uh, so we will we'll do a cupcake redo at some point. Yeah, we'll have to do a cupcake redo so that everybody gets a cupcake. It sounds like they needed cupcakes at committee today. So now there is a lot that you were sort of forced into in that first month of office, declaring a climate emergency budget. You had personality issues with a certain counselor, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But I want to talk about that first budget process, because as a sitting counselor, as a newly sitting counselor, and you're relatively having very new counsel in general, what was it for you that helped you mold with the team to make sure that you were doing this for the city and not, as we said in our previous interview, just for your ward? Yeah. Um, so prior to budget, we, um, we've had amazing training put through the clerk's team, um, and the executive leadership team and through administration, they've put through a lot of information and that we got a lot of very detailed information on the budget and what we could expect. And so while we may not have seen the full package until kind of about a, you know, a week or so before we were having conversations essentially from day one on, on what we could, what we could expect um coming out of that process and then and then also being asked you know what do we what do we want to see in there as well uh so right so some of those additions that came in so around the indigenous gathering place and around climate um that came out of those early formative conversations that we had as a team uh and so i felt equipped i mean it was the last year in a four-year cycle so recognizing there were some commitments that had been made um by the previous council and being able to honor those commitments and that you know, our work right now is, is to design the next four years. Um, and that is where we truly get to put our mark um, on the projects and and the pieces that we, are, we think of our value for the city. Now, one of the biggest obstacles in that first few months, that first month when you're doing a budget that's already kind of set in stone from the previous uh, council is taking what you heard at the doorstep and bringing it to the bu- to the budget table, but also council table. So how did that weigh in for you? Because you have this budget that is kind of already set in place, but you have things that you want to advocate for because you've heard them at the doorstep. So how did you balance that challenge as well? So for me, it was looking at like, this wasn't the only opportunity that I get to take what I heard on the doors and, and, and make an effect change in our city. Um, so there were pieces in that budget, right? The Indigenous, right? Putting money towards, um, so Indigenous and reconciliation, putting money towards climate. Those were things I heard on the doors that were, um, that people valued. Um, there were were pieces in the budget that I, that I couldn't align with. Um, so that was like CPS funding, for example. But at the end of the day, what I heard was a balance for my colleagues. And we voted on essentially every in- item individually, um, to compose that budget and then to pass that budget. And was so it, was it challenging? Sorry to interrupt. Was it challenging? Yeah. Because you said you, you've had to vote on every single issue. Was it challenging to vote on a budget that you might not fully agree with because sometimes your vote doesn't win out of the 15 people around the council table? Was it hard to say, okay, I like the budget. There's certain things that I don't like, but at the end of the day, I can live with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at the end of the day, we put it through the, pro- the democratic process and we voted on things. And, and, and that's what, you know, that, that is part of 
accepting the rule that you're in is that you are just one at one vote of 15 um, and that there are times that you're going to be on the losing side of a vote, um, but you have to respect why your colleagues might be on the winning side of a vote. And, and ultimately at the end of the day, like there was nothing in that package that I couldn't truly live with. Um, I would have spoken out very, very loudly about it. Um, we have a really strong administrative team. They understand what Calgarians are looking for. They do extensive research on citizen satisfaction. Um, and they hear and they reflect based on what they know. So um, I'm happy with the budget that's passed. Um, and now we look forward, to, I look forward to shaping the next four year budget. Now, one of the big things that we talked about in our interview during the election was what you want sort of to do as a counselor. And one of those things was connections with people. You talked about people a lot. Now, I know it's only been 100 days, but one of the things that you said in that interview, yet again, season three, episode 27, if you want to look at it, go for it, go for it. Um, one of the things that you said was you wanted to reach out to your competitors, the people who ran against you and say, thank you for opening this dialogue. What are the things mm -hmm. that you heard so we can collaborate, but yeah. also, and I use the word collaborate for a reason, that was your slogan, but how... How did you do that? Have you done that? Have you reached out to your fellow competitors, thank them for running, but also understand what they heard at the door as well? Yeah, so I've had the chance to thank, um, you know, I had the chance to thank the majority of them. Um, I would really love to have that conversation in person. So I've, I've stayed in touch and I've said like, you know, we talked about it um, and I was like, okay, why? It was sort of like on my docket for like early January and then we're kind of in this like restriction world. And so <laughs> recognizing um, just what we're asking of people. So I, I have stayed in touch um, most mostly with Lauren. Um, I've spoken with Jeff as well, but um, absolutely always open. Like I'm still open to that and we will still make that happen. Just sort of, it's going to be about finding the time. So, so and, you, you uh, set up the perfect segue into my next line of questioning <laughs> is time. Yeah. You, this is a unique beast that you're working as a politician, as a city councilor. This is a unique job that you have. Only a few people have ever had it in this world. How do you find the time? How has the transition from Courtney Penner, the person outside of the campaign, to councilor Penner that we have now? Because I can imagine it is tough. I know my husband, when he went through politics, it put a weight on him because he had to be on, he had to always be doing things, but he also always had to be engaged with people because that's the name of the job. How has the transition for you been to that outgoing, and you've always been outgoing, but outgoing, reliable person that people can come and talk to? Uh, I don't think it's really changed that much. I mean, I'm happy to not be campaigning. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to have some time back on my weekends. Uh, my family is very happy to have some time back with me on weekends. Um, and I, I know that the hours can be long some days. There is also opportunity um, to, to flex my schedule. I am still taking my kids to school. I am still picking my kids up from school. I am still connecting with friends. I am still... Um, you know, making time for myself and what I need in order to take care of like, you know, my mental health and my physical health. And, and there are times that are challenging. The, the, it has, it has, I will say it has gotten much easier since the beginning of January. The first two months were absolutely um, overwhelming. Um, since January, since the Christmas break, I have felt more of a flow and a consistency and, and predictability and in kind of the ups and downs. And, and some days are, are more challenging than others. And we can't, I can't predict the news cycle. I can't predict what, right? What it's always going to happen. Um, and so, yes, there is de a degree of responsiveness, uh, but I'm also quite comfortable to know that we are we are working for long term solutions. So sometimes we have to make some sort of short term decisions, but we're working for long term, and so it's about it's about balancing that pace. You, you talked about balance. Um, it must be challenging because your life is now kind of in the public sphere because you are a sitting councillor. People know who you are. Uh, you get sort of 
put under the microscope for everything you do. I uh, I was joking with you beforehand, but I want to talk about the while it's, there's some good to the job and get to make change, you get to affect change, you get to see the bad side of the job as well. And that and I don't say that this is a negative thing, yeah. but you posted a fun photo of you wearing a jacket that matched the carpet in your office and the attacks that you got. How does that not weigh like you down and say, how can you not have fun in this job when people are so putting you under the microscope? Um. Well, I mean, if you can't have fun and you can't laugh at yourself, like you're never going to make it through this job. Um, so the fact that I found 45 seconds in my day to laugh at myself um, and that the majority of responses were quite punny and funny. Um, so that was great. And, and so that yeah, hater's going to hate Chris. And um, and you know, that's, that's them. If, if they are, um, that unfunny, I feel, I feel kind of bad for them. Um, I feel bad that they can't laugh at the coincidences that happen in our life. So, um, yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a choice. You either choose to let them bother you or you choose not to. I mean, we had, we had, we had people who didn't like the fact that we named our snow plows and my teen said, who wouldn't like the fact that you named a snowplow and I got to say snowflakes. <laughs> okay. So, so we have to laugh and we have to make fun of the situations, you know, that happen, like matching the carpet in your office. And how, then you get up and you, and you do the work. How's the union of the council? Can you rely on your fellow counselors if you call them up and say, Hey guys, it's been a tough day. You've probably seen on social media that I'm being attacked for wearing a same, for posting a photo of me and a, a jacket that looks like our carpet. Like, can we go out and have, no, you can't because social distancing and COVID rules and all that. But can we just have a virtual Zoom council where it's just us and we're just shooting the shit or, pardon my French, or is it very work all the time with your fellow counselors? Oh, Chris, we work all the time. There is zero fun that happens. That's no, why no one I, took the um, cupcakes. <laughs> I have a wonderful working relationship with my colleagues. Um, <laughs> and, and, and some that may surprise people and some that may not surprise people. But I, um, I, I, truly, um, I truly enjoy my colleagues and, I, and that outside of sometimes what you see on the council floor, like there are conversations and moments of just humanity and humility amongst us. And yes, we can call each other. Like, yes, I have those colleagues because it is a job, right? Like no other. And it's one that we uniquely understand. Um, and it's important that our staff are doing that with other counselor staff. And so I know that happens as well too. So building those teams is really important um, to help us get through. <laughs> I want to talk about some of the decisions that this council has made over the last 100 days, literally 100 days again. And I should preamble that before I start, continue on. Remember, I see a few other people have logged on to the YouTube channel. If you wish to ask a question, please don't hesitate to type it in. We'll ask Councillor Penner during the interview. So please don't hesitate to ask a question if you wish. And we will ask that to the councillor here today. Um, but let's turn to some of the decisions. And I think the first one we have to talk about is the very first big one that you made, which was the environmental crisis or emergency climate emergency. My mind is not working correctly here. Paul, I apologize right now, but the emergency declaration that the city made around climate change, was this important to you? Absolutely. Why? So... On a personal level, I believe that climate change is affecting us and that we need to take action. Um, from a global perspective on how our city is viewed, um, it is absolutely very important that we are acknowledging and recognizing um, scientific evidence um, and that we are signaling to the community um, socially, economically, uh, that we are invested in a future of this world um, 
that that wants to see a future in this world and that wants to see a sustainable future of this world. I'm just playing devil's advocate here because I've heard this from people and I know you should never trust what Twitter says because it's a microcosm of everything in this world. And actually that's untrue. If it happens on Twitter, it's totally true no matter what. Absolutely. Um, what benefits does the city get declaring an emergency like this? The, the, I think that will be realized in time. I think there so it's a are... long-term game. It's not a short-term. Absolutely. Right. The, the, it's a long-term game just and and that is that is what we do when we make decisions we are we are making a decision in time that is looking towards the future and we are looking towards what is coming and what is before us um and and we're you know we use the evidence that we have today to make the decisions for the future um so the the short-term benefit did anything immediately come out of it to be determined right um I think we had some people who were very excited about that decision. I think that we um, caught the attention of people. Um, will we see how that materializes eventually? Yes. And I look forward to, be able to being able to share those stories. I do too. When you come back on the show in two years time or yeah. right before the next election, you can tell us all about it. Um, totally. The next area is the arena, the event center, I should say, the event center. This, yeah. I think, took a lot of people by surprise because this council made it a priority. They, but During the budget deliberations, it was a topic of discussion and it was a lively discussion, if I remember correctly. This upset people when they found out that uh, Calgary Entertainment, or the CES or whatever you want to call them, walked away from the table. Can you explain to us a little bit more about what happened? Because I think there's still a lot of people who just don't know. Yeah. Um, so Chris, I think it took us on council by surprise. I don't think it was what any of us were predicting were gonna happen. I mean, we had been through the development permit process, right, at planning commission, and which would have potentially seen like an off ramp um, and that didn't happen. And so for it to come, you know, six weeks after. Um, and six weeks before, like groundbreaking <laughs> was supposed to happen. It was supposed to happen in January. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, it, you know, it caught everyone by surprise. Right. And I think recognizing that, yes, through, I mean, there were conditions, right? As as with any development permit, there were conditions and that would have led to further costing um, and further kind of procurement strategies and, and requests for proposals and, and all the things that go into any large construction project and, um, you know, actively worked with the city on some of those identified things. But I think at the end of the day, what we saw was what is happening across many industries, across many sectors, across many deals is that procurement of goods, um, certainty of costs, um, and certainty of what gathering and restrictions and being able to fill enter large entertainment venues in the future um, with still the unknowns of COVID. I mean, we were entering a fifth wave um, which had a lot of unknowns. There was just, I think, a, a large degree of uncertainty around the project. And that was not comfortable for CSEF to move forward. And it's it's not worth pointing fingers and blame at anybody. It is unfortunate. Um, it is it is a setback. And but it is also an opportunity to move forward. Um, and to and to rethink and, and to really reaffirm our value and our commitment to how we build our city and, and for who we build our city and what are those elements that we believe are really, really important. I want to turn locally now. I kind of say locally as a joke here because locally we're talking about Calgary, but Ward 11, <laughs> your ward in particular. And I want to talk about what well, we just got a fabulous new arena upgrade, Chris. I can tell you that. Exactly. That's where we were going with this. How how has the transition being from campaigning to 
counselor of Ward 11 because now people, you're not going to them. They're coming to you and you're, you you literally just have to sit in your office. You probably don't because you probably want to go out and meet people. But you're sitting there and people are co commenting, asking you questions, reaching out to your office. Take me through the process of how Counselor Penner has changed and how, has, how you've adapted to being a community leader now and answering the questions that you once had as a resident yourself, which you still yeah. are. Yeah, so my focus, Chris, has been really on building a highly capable team. So we have three staff, I have three staff members um, responsible for various components of support and doing the job and working with residents. And so, um, so Ward 11, we have 18 different community associations. Um, so we've talked about how we're going to support those community associations, you know, split up that work. We're getting to know those community associations and I'll, and some of this, um, we, there are also like sport organizations in Ward 11, so the sailing club and the canoe club. And so we're, we're connecting with a lot of those individuals and groups, um, heritage park, some of the other civic partners that we have. So understanding the role and the relationship. So that's, that's been a big piece, but specifically Ward 11, has been yeah just talking with a lot of community groups that are doing some advocacy work there around the, the various things but then yeah making sure that my team is equipped to support residents so that when requests come in um they are able to problem solve and troubleshoot and connect with those in administration to get answers and so they've also been doing a lot of their own learning which has been Right. We use a program that's not been the easiest to learn, but they are powering through and they're doing amazing things. And 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 I so my focus has really been on, um, you know, learning how the city is working, learning who I need to be talking to so that I can support my team. Um, but also then when our large groups and organizations are, are taking on projects that we can support them or if residents are coming to us with ideas, we can bring those forward. So whether those are traffic concerns or snow and, snow and ice concerns, we are building kind of our sort of like our database of knowledge so that we can respond really quickly. So that is our goal. And our goal is to stay on task. And we've, we've set out our priorities of who we respond to and how we respond and what our communication standards are. Um, and then the flip side of that is some of those ideas that have come out of the campaign, putting those into motion. So working through the administrative team to be bringing forward notices of motion, to be understanding some of the opportunities that exist. And so that's kind of a little bit of like the unseen work. Um, and then we're working and we had actually a, a large engagement strategy planned to start in January. Um, and with uh, the COVID numbers being the way they are, we knew that this wasn't the best time to launch a large public facing <laughs> in-person um, strategy. So we are just, we're just sort of on the tipping point of what that looks like and, and being out again in community and coming up with like unique and novel ways. I, I mean, through the campaign, we're at the dog parks fairly often. We will get back to the dog parks. We've talked about working with the library. We've talked about using our recreation facilities. And so meeting people kind of in those spaces that introduce them to those amazing civic facilities and amenities that we have, uh, while also providing an opportunity for conversation. What's and then going back, oh, go yeah, ahead. go. Okay, As I say, okay. and then just going back to community associations, just how are we gonna connect them with each other and build capacity there as well so that they can connect with residents, so. Now, the issues that were prevalent in August, September, October are no longer prevalent. Well, not as prevalent as they are right now. A week in politics is a long time. A hundred days in politics is like an eternity. Are you hearing things that you, from your office, from constituents that you didn't expect to hear? Were you, are you hearing things that you're going, oh, I didn't know this was an issue. We need to fix this. We need to find a solution. Or are, is what you're hearing sort of the similar things that you were hearing at the doorsteps during the campaign? So yes and no. Like, yes, <laughs> we've heard some like novel things, right? We've, we've tackled a few, um, you know, no one complains to you about their emergency water break on the door. They talk to you about it when it's actually happening. <laughs> Right. And so we've we've supported a business through that. Um, we have um, uh, we've identified that this, the city doesn't have um, a practice 
or a very good practice for hiring individuals with cognitive disabilities. And so how can we look at that? Um, Counselor Mean and I are looking at dog poop and how can we get dog poop from our parks to composting facilities? Um, and I didn't Did think you ever I would think never... you'd ever say that as a sitting counselor? Counselor Mian and I are talking about dog poop. Yeah, no. Or did I ever like, like, could you imagine making that as a campaign promise? Like that, I just don't, I mean, maybe people would have responded really well, but, but a lot of it just came up like in our learnings about how, about those, like those operational learnings on how we function as a city and what's, and what we do well and what we can maybe try to do different. Uh, yeah. I mean, a lot, I mean, we get concerns like from, street lights to potholes to I mean everyday concerns and and we work through as needed and we work with our partners in 311 and we work with our partners at administration and and um and and it's and it's and then as you say that the political cycle is short so what was an issue three weeks ago no one has on their radar anymore one of the issues that has been was on the radar of a lot of people on October 25th as uh, you were sworn in or as all counselors were sworn in. I think I know where you think I think you know where I'm going with this um, is your fellow counselor for Ward 4, Sean Chum. I'm going to say here right here right now he should resign. He should be out of office for what he's allegedly done. How is it to work with someone that you have openly called for their resignation? How is the dynamic different than your other counselors? Or I, I just, I need to know from your perspective, and this might be a touchy question, and I do apologize if I ask it weirdly, but I want to know, how can you work with someone who you've openly called for their resignation? You focus on the issues. So... Because you're dealing with police budgets, you're dealing with mental health, and I'm sorry, but and I'm not trying to turn this into a negative thing. I just I have yeah. to ask the question because it is on a lot of people's mind, and there hasn't been a lot of Twitter feed about this resigned Sean Chu in the last few weeks, and I just don't want it to be forgotten that it is still yeah. there. The, the elephant is still in the room. The elephant is still in the room. You're absolutely right, Chris. The elephant is still in the room, and it is hard to negotiate at times. I, I don't disagree. And I, I believe he should resign. And I believe we, I mean, we weren't going to talk about this, but someone who should resign, then calling foul on a chief of staff is really rich. Worse. Well, sorry, I just had to put it out there. And so when I say focus on the issues, there was a situation that came before committee um, that had to do with um, something in Ward 4. Councilor Chu wasn't originally at the original committee meeting. And so when it came to council, um, it needed advocacy. And I was the original person who actually advocated at committee for it because I saw the value that it provided Calgarians. And so I let him know that I was on board with advocating and how I would support because I felt that it was good for Calgarians. And so you would have seen me back him in his call and second emotion because I believed in what the issue was before us. Yeah. When we talked, when we talked about funding for indigenous gathering spaces and there was a deeply insensitive comment that we should just put it somewhere else and not invest any money. Absolutely. I took him to task. And so, so you should, and I appreciate you being honest and blunt about that. And I don't want to spend more time than I have to on that gentleman. So I'm going to move on to the next subject. And that is outside of your role as a city councilor, as a local representative, you are the chair of two committees. One, the Community Development Committee, which I have no idea. I've, I have I worked in municipal politics before, and I don't know what that is. And the Emergency Management Committee. Let's start with the easy one first, Emergency <laughs> Management, because that's the one I kind of have an idea what it's about. How has it been to chair a committee that you have to deal with COVID-19 on a regular basis? Yeah. Um, so actually, most of our COVID-19 updates have actually come through community development or direct oh. accounts. <laughs> Jesus. 
I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm no, sorry. it's okay. So let me, so let me just, so I'll say this. Um, so um, council used to have four standing policy committees, um, have, which are now two standing policy committees. So there's the infrastructure and planning committee, which council Carra chairs. And then there is the community development committee, which I chair. By default of chairing the community development committee, I'm the chair of the emergency management committee. Um, so that that is that relationship. Okay. And um, so the emergency management committee, we get reports on a regular basis from Calgary Emergency Management Agency, so SEMA, um, on essentially emergency preparedness. Um, so it um, so our last one we got one on like how we would respond to a rail disaster. So we get updates on how we are going to respond. So we have knowledge and, and insight. It is also a place where if we did have an emergency, like a flood or a fire, um, I can call that meeting within an hour's notice so that we can put in an emergency um, plan. And so I work closely with Chief Sue Henry um, and our partners in community standards to understand what that is. And so, and then, yeah, so then the flip side is like our big, our bigger standing policy committee then is um, community development. And so that is where the majority of reports on various um administrative things come forward and they we approve them from committee to go to council now take me through the process for those who might not know who might be listening to sure. this or watching this at a later time did you choose these committees or was it basically a random pick of the draw because i i as i said before i've worked on municipal in municipal politics before so i know that sometimes it is a pick of the draw where you grab into the hat and you pull out and you're like oh i'm on this committee for here in calgary is it that way or were you able to be elected to that so i was appointed by my peers so i was nominated by my peers and then elected where are you have you learned more about yourself in those positions as the chair of those two committees that you didn't know about as as a candidate penner um i was i was really flattered to be nominated by my peers and i think i um it it affirmed i guess for me um the support i had from my peers and i'm and i'm and i'm grateful for that uh so i i do need to recognize that that it is it's an honor and it's a privilege um and yeah it's come with some additional like learning responsibilities but it's also come with an opportunity um because as chair you do more listening than thinking um uh, and so it's really a great position to be in as well um I'm just cautious of time here. We're coming up on the yeah. hour mark here. And I, I just have one last area I want to talk about. And then we'll uh, do the wrap up here, uh, Councillor Penner. I want to talk about what's next. We, we've talked about in the last few uh, out minutes that a week in politics is a long time. So we can never be prepared. What's next for you? What is the next goal? Because I'm going to say this I, at the two year mark. So in 2024, you are coming back on the show or 2023, I should say. You're coming back on the show. We're going to do the halfway mark 2023, right? 2023, 25. Oh, my God. My mind is blanking here. I apologize. Everyone yes, who's I will come back. At the, we're just going to say this, Chris. Yes, I'll come back at the two year mark. The halfway mark. What's next? What do you have to do now? You're 100 days in, you've got your sea legs working. What's next for Councillor Penner? Yeah, so my team is just finishing the touches on what our four-year, what our personal four-year plan is. So the, the projects that we heard a lot on the campaign trail, especially like those large community projects, so challenges with intersections, challenges with sound and noise, um, failing infrastructure. So getting those on the work list. So that is the goal over the next four years. And so determining when we're gonna bring those, those issues forward. So that's kind of a little bit, but then also that community building side of things, what is the capacity that we wanna build in communities? And so laying out that strategy over the next four years as well. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a bit of a balance and and it's and it's going to be flexible. I mean, we're going to we're, all right, we're going to make this lovely Gantt chart and then we're going to have to like, you know, burn it one day and start all over again. Um, but really what we're looking at is pacing, pacing out that work over four years, leaving room for urgent items to come forward. Um, and then, you know, if those urgent items don't come forward, like what are the other good things that we can do? And it's going to be a balance of 
fun. We're going to bring some fun things forward that may seem maybe trivial, um, <laughs> but also really valuable to certain Calgarians. Um, so I think of things like naming the snow plows, right? I, I said it will seem trivial, but it is one of those moments that just it's low barrier. It's a little bit of fun. It's a bright spot in a kind of otherwise like chaotic news cycle. Um, and so, so just what's your favorite name? I've got to ask since you brought it up. What's your favorite name on the list? It of... was Ka Kawaplunga. <laughs> okay. So I, I just, I, we have seen so much vile and hate thrown at Mayor Gondak in the last hundred days with protest outside of her house. We have seen protest outside of MPs houses. The council recently passed a, uh, a expend expenditure for security systems. I, I, I say this with all like hesitation, but I'm going to ask it in a point blank way. Do you feel safe in your job? seeing what's going on because I, I like that we can be joking about snowplow names but I've seen it and I, I feel like if someone listens to this and they're like oh she's laughing on the fact that this that and the other and I'm like okay she's a human being you're a human being everyone's a human being do you feel safe in your position I feel safe but I also have a deep sense of worry and I just, I have a deep sense of worry that comes from the disconnect that we've experienced over the past two years. Um, and that there are people in elected leadership positions who are preying on that disconnect and preying on the division and adding fuel to, to those fires. And so I, I worry actually about people and I worry about what it means for us to have that capacity to do good things in our city and build community and build resilience. Um, so, yes, overall, I feel safe. So I do worry, but but I think um, my optimism at the end of the day outweighs any worry that I might have. So the reason I asked that question, and I asked it at the end here, is because as a sitting councillor, you have to make... Right. No, it's okay. It's all good. I'm just kidding, Chris. <laughs> God, don't do that to me. I almost had a heart attack. I don't need cancer and a heart attack at the same time. Um, geez. We... You are heading into an unknown four-year budget cycle where you're going to have to make some very tough decisions because the state of the economy, inflation is a matter that a lot of people are talking about. COVID-19 is still here. As much as people want it gone, it's still here. When you see protests outside of the sitting mayor's house, MP's houses, does that make you think, I have to really make sure I'm voting the way I want to vote or I need to vote for the way that the people outside these houses want me to vote because I don't want to anger them and have them show up at my house. Because I read the letter that you posted on social media where you had to have a conversation with your kids. I, I, I can't imagine having that conversation as a parent with your kids. So I, I, and this is probably why I'll never be elected to office because I'm scared shitless sometimes, part of my French, of some things that happen. So I can imagine as a parent of young children, it's worrisome that if you vote a certain way on a certain issue that someone doesn't like, they're going to show up at your house. <laughs> I'm not trying to make this a downer moment at the end of this no, interview. I, I just want to get your yeah. opinion. So, like, I, I can choose. Like I can, no, no, I can. I can choose to be worried, right? And and the worry is there. Like, don't get me wrong, Chris. The worry is there. Will that fear ever drive the way I vote? No, because I I'm also needing to reflect the counter side of that argument that's being presented to me, and I feel like I was elected by individuals who 
are on the counter side of that and who are looking for someone who values community and values investment and values building our city and to be strong socially, economically and climate. And so, again, I have to make decisions for the long term, not the short term. This the, what we are seeing from a political climate, it is it is a not a forever thing. Um, is it going away anytime soon? Unfortunately, probably not. Um, we have seen unrest rise dramatically, right, for the past four years. I think the counter to that is conviction. I think the counter to that is consistency. And I think that we overcome it by helping, by helping people. And we get back to getting people connected um, and and feeling safe. They they are reacting out of fear. They are reacting out of themselves, feeling scared. And if we are if we both come together like that, we don't get good outcomes. I appreciate your honesty and being candor about that. And uh, I want to turn to kind of a the last words here before we do our official wrap up. And this is kind of the sort of uh, uh, quick fire questions that I had during the campaign, but kind of more on the counselor's perspective. <laughs> In one sentence, actually, let's let's say two to three sentences. How would you explain, how would you describe your first hundred days in office? Oh, God. Um, some of the biggest highs and some of the biggest lows. Um, incredible gratitude, um, incredible opportunity and optimism. Um, but also um, a, a real, <laughs> a very realization um, that, that, and, and I knew it, but that change is hard. And and not from a policy perspective, um, change is hard from having the collective come on board with what that policy change could mean. Knowing now what you, knowing, knowing now what you, if you would have known now <laughs> what you knew when you announced I would have known then what I know now. Yeah. Would you have still ran? Totally. Why? Um, I really love what I'm doing, Chris. I really like the people and I love the people around me. I really like my team. Um, and I'm knowing, knowing now, um, you know, who does what and how things get done. It's actually easier to understand how to make change and, and, and when and how that change can come about and what are the steps to do it. Um, and my goal then would be, to, you know, as I continue to learn that too, um, to help other people understand that. Um, and um, we talk about rebuilding trust in government. This I'm sorry, this is more than two to three sentences, quick fire. Um, we talk about rebuilding trust in government, and I think that comes from dry, from giving people information, from giving people clarity. Um, and so that is that continues to be the goal. Do you still still learn things every day on the job? Absolutely. And my last quick fire question for you is this. Where do you go from here? You you seem to be enjoying the job. What wh I always try to better myself. So what better is Councillor Penner now? Like, is it meeting more people? Is it talking to more people? Is it hopefully after restrictions are done, getting out and meeting people? What betters Councillor Penner to be a better counselor? Yeah, I think I think getting out and engaging back with the community. Um, I'm missing it. I, I told my team um, just yesterday how anxious I was to get out and how I was. It was just it was like it's just burning in me to get out. Um, and so for, so for me, that's my what's next. Um, and and thinking and um, I think I really well, I like I know I do. I love hosting events. Um, and so being really intentional in what we do for the community and how we engage with the community, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited to see how we can shape and transform that as well over the four years based on how people respond. Um, and how also, I mean, my colleagues are doing some cool stuff too. And so how I can watch and learn from them as well. 
Awesome. Um, Counselor Penner, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. But before we go, I told everyone at the beginning of this that we would announce how much money we raised. And I, when I originally planned this, I know we're going to do a drum roll in about two seconds. <laughs> when I originally planned this, I was expecting from my perspective, like five, 10 people want to come out and spend their evening with us. But we had an overwhelming, uh, um, overwhelming uh, surge of support and i appreciate everyone who's donated and given to a worthy cause so without further ado tonight's total that we are giving to the women's center of calgary is blah blah blah, blah, blah. that's my drum roll i want to thank every single one of you who bought a ticket this money is going to a worthy cause like councillor penner said at the beginning of this this is a great organization and they do some great work for the community so thank you everyone for buying a ticket um, can i say thank you chris yeah, go for it go for it to, uh, to everyone who came out and bought tickets thank you um that is so wonderful and as as i as a small organization like $255 is, it's a big deal for them, but, uh, I am going to be, I haven't told you this, but I'm going to match that donation. Aww. And I haven't mm -hmm. told, I think I told you this, but I'm not hundred percent sure, but out of the 50% of the profits that the show made the cross board interviews with Chris Brown, we're donating a hundred dollars of our profits to the organization as well, because we believe this is a great organization. I do appreciate everyone who bought tickets. So thank you. I've already reached out to their executive director, Bo Masterson. She is expecting a check in the mail because businesses have to do it that way, we guess. So um, thank you so much, Councillor Penner for doing this. If you haven't already, we are back next Thursday with counselor for Ward 3, Jasmine Meehan. Uh, she is going to be coming on and answering almost the exact same questions, except unless she's representing Ward 11, I just don't know it. She's going to be talking about Ward 3. So buy tickets for that as well. The uh, tickets for that proceeds will be going to the Vivo all community i'm gonna oh my mind is blanking right now vivo is the organization that we're raising money for so please 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 join us next thursday for another great episode of the cross board interviews with chris brown live via youtube counselor penner once more thank you so much thank you <laughs> we totally just had the dog bark moment sir <laughs> there you go um, anyway, guys, have yourself an excellent rest of your day and enjoy your rest of your Thursday. And remember, tomorrow morning, if you're still watching this, tomorrow morning, opening ceremonies at 5 a.m. So watch it. <laughs>